So this is analysis of variance, or ANOVA, in SPSS. This tutorial is divided into three parts. During part one and part two, we're going to cover one example. And then in part three, which will hopefully be a little bit shorter, we're going to go over in brief the second example. So the objectives of these three videos are to help you compare two or more independent samples using analysis of variance. To do that, we'll specify null and alternative hypotheses. We'll check assumptions using the explore function and the compare means function in SPSS. We'll compute an F ratio using the compare means function in SPSS. When we do that, we will also calculate an omnibus effect size. We're going to calculate partial eta squared, but there are a couple of different alternatives, so different ways of expressing effect size in both the pink book and in field that you can compute based on SPSS output. We're also going to conduct some additional tests, those planned contrast or post hoc tests, and we'll report the results of example one in APA style. Now to complete the exercises in these three videos, you're going to need to have SPSS up and running as usual. You're going to be going through your pink book and the chapter related to this tutorial is chapter seven. And you're going to use the data files data underscore seven underscore one dot SAV and data underscore seven underscore two dot SAV. You can get those files either from the Pink Book Companion website or from the topic seven page on Moodle. The type of analysis of variance that we're covering today, which is a between groups one way analysis of variance, is a test of whether the means of two or more independent samples are different. We're covering one way between groups analysis of variance first because it's the most straightforward. You use one way between groups analysis of variance in research when you have a dependent variable that is numeric. In other words, the number represents a number of some construct rather than an arbitrary value or a rank and you have one independent variable or one predictor variable and only one variable. The F ratio we're going to get is based on a comparison of sample means for the however many samples we've got. This analysis of variance is the parametric equivalent of the Kruskal-Wallis analysis of variance that we covered back in topic four. When we get a significant result, that is when the F ratio uh, leads us to conclude that the null hypothesis should be rejected, what that means is that all group means are not equal. It doesn't tell us anything about which groups are different. So in that circumstance, that is when we get a statistically significant F ratio, we need to do some additional tests. So here's table 7.1 which is on page 76 of the pink book. So the illustrated example from uh, page 76 is that a researcher wants to investigate the impact of education support services on the attitudes of teachers towards mainstreaming of children with disabilities into their classrooms. So including students with special needs in their classrooms. She selects 30 teachers to participate in the study and divides them into three groups and presumably there's random selection, random allocation into each group. The first group is kind of a control group and it consists of 10 teachers who receive no additional classroom support. The second group consists of 10 teachers who receive three hours of in-class teacher aid time per day. Sounds like a very generous amount of additional support. And then the third group consists of 10 teachers who participate in a weekly peer support program. So that's both shorter than the teacher aid support, so they don't receive as much in terms of number of hours, and it's different in nature. It's not in class, it's after the fact. Now at the end of the school term, each teacher is asked to complete the attitude towards mainstreaming scale. This is an 18 item questionnaire containing statements about the inclusion of children with disabilities into schools. It was first used, I guess, by Behrman, Neal, and Robinson in 1980. Scores on this scale can range from 0 to 18, with higher scores reflecting more positive or more favorable attitudes towards mainstreaming. And I just want to emphasize the point here 
that each teacher completed this attitude towards mainstreaming scale once, and that was at the end of term. Uh, so this is not a pre-post design where we look at how much the attitude towards mainstreaming has changed. We're only looking at it once. So this researcher would like to know whether teachers who received support held more positive attitudes towards mainstreaming, and if they did, what type of support resulted in the most positive attitude. And Table 7.1 shows the attitudes towards mainstreaming scale scores of all 30 teachers organized in each group. All right, before we move on, I would like you to pause the video and think about what is the research question here? What's the null hypothesis? And if you like, what is a possible alternative hypothesis? You can come up with a directional hypothesis or a non-directional alternative hypothesis. And to help you organize your thinking, I want to encourage you to first identify what is the dependent variable and what's the independent variable in this case. All right, ready? I'll catch you on the other side. All right, so here's my research question. Does receiving support affect teachers' attitudes towards mainstreaming students with disabilities? And this is uh, sort of paraphrased, almost uh, quoted directly from the first paragraph of the description of this research uh, at the top of page 76. The independent variable is the type of support the teachers received, and it is a true independent variable because the teachers were randomly assigned to each group. And I'm abbreviating each of the groups as none, aid, and peer. So none meaning they received no individual in additional classroom support. Aid uh, to be the teacher aid condition, that's group two in table 7.1 and then peer, meaning peer support, group three. And that's just so that when I write about them, I don't have to be writing out uh, no support condition every time I type it out. The dependent variable is attitudes towards mainstreaming scale scores. And again, this is a scale that each teacher completed only once, so it's not pre-post. It's just looking at, at the end of the uh, class term. So the null hypothesis is that attitudes were the same for all groups. The mean attitude towards mainstreaming scale score was the same for the no support group as for the teacher aid group as for the peer support group. All right, that's our null, null hypothesis. And I asked you to come up with an alternative hypothesis. When we've been talking about t-tests, we are generally faced with uh, three different options for alternative hypothesis hypotheses. Basically, group one might have the larger mean. We might hypothesize group one has the larger mean, which would be a directional hypothesis. We might have a directional hypothesis in the opposite direction. Group two has the larger mean. Or we might have a non-directional hypothesis, which is just that the two means are not equal. With analysis of variance, there's a lot more than three possible alternative hypotheses. Right? I'm just going to go over the non-directional versions of these because our, our most basic alternative hypothesis that um, captures all of the alternatives that are not the null hypothesis is just that attitudes were not the same for all groups. So that could be that the no support group had, had different scores than the teacher aid group and the peer support group, but the teacher aid group and the peer support group had similar scores. Or it could be that the no support group and the teacher aid group had similar scores, but both were different from the peer support group. Or it could be that the no support and the peer support groups had similar scores, but the teacher aid was different. Or it could be that all three were different. This is not an exhaustive list, but I hope that uh, what it does is it illustrates to you that there is one way that the null hypothesis could be correct, 
and lots of ways that this most generic alternative hypothesis could be correct, which is why when we get a statistically significant F ratio and we reject the null hypothesis, we need to go and do some further investigation to more precisely characterize our data set. So if you're ready now, what I'd like you to do is open up that data file data underscore seven underscore one dot SAV in SPSS and we'll start having a look around at the data. Right, so here I am, I've switched over from data view, which is where we start when we open a data file to uh, variable view. And we can see here that there are two columns. In so the two variables that we have are the support variable. So this indicates which group the participant, the teacher was assigned to. So it specifies which support group each teacher belonged to. So its label is support group. And if we click on the value labels, we can see there's three. So value label one indicates no support. Value label two for the teacher teacher's aid. So the teachers have got three hours of teacher aid. And then value label three codes the peer support group. So that's our, so that's our independent variable. Our dependent variable is the second variable, attitude. So that's that teacher attitude towards mainstreaming. And there's no value labels there because it's just a score from 0 to 18. Based the higher the score, the more positive the teacher's attitude towards mainstreaming. Okay, so in data view, we can see the two columns. We've got our support independent variable coded as a uh, nominal or grouping variable and then our attitude dependent variable as a scale variable. The data are organized in two columns this way with a grouping variable and a dependent variable rather than in three columns the way they were organized in table 7.1 because in SPSS each row represents a different case. So that means because we've got 30 different teachers, we need 30 different rows. As with any statistical test, analysis of variance involves some assumptions. They are that the dependent variable should be interval or ratio data. As far as we're concerned, this questionnaire, because the numbers represent numbers, then uh, we can consider this a, an interval scale measure. Each participant should participate only once in the research and their participation should not influence the participation of others. That's the assumption of independence of observations, which is a design issue. So we can't really be certain based on anything in SPSS that this was upheld. But one thing that we can see is that we reported there were 30 different teachers and we can see that there are 10 in each group, which adds up to 30, which suggests that no teacher participated multiple times uh, in multiple conditions. Uh, and certainly it would be a red flag if the number of participants in each group did not add up to the total number of participants in an independent samples design. The third assumption is the assumption of normality which is that each group of scores should be approximately normally distributed. Each group of scores should be drawn from a, no a population with a normal distribution. Uh, so analysis of variance, like, uh, just like independent samples t-tests, are one way between, sub between groups. ANOVA is generally robust with respect to moderate violations of this assumption. It's still important to check it out, though. And then the last assumption is homogeneity of variance. Uh, so there should be an approximately equal amount of variability in each set of scores. The assumption of normality is the one that we can assess by using SPSS's explore function. And then just like with independent samples t-tests, we will evaluate the assumption of homogeneity of variance when we actually conduct the analysis of variance. So 
As we've done several times before, we're going to explore these data organized in each group. So we click Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and then Explore. And in the Explore window, we want to select our dependent variable for the dependent list. So that's teacher attitude is our dependent variable. So that's going to go into dependent list. And the support group, our independent variable, belongs in the factor list. Right? And as we've done several times before, I'm going to select the plots button. I'm going to deselect the stem and leaf. If you want to take a look at it, be my guest. It can't hurt to look at additional data. I'm going to look at a histogram. You don't have to. And I'm definitely going to look at normality plots so I can get those QQ plots. Click Continue, and then OK. All right, so here's all of our output from the Explore function. We've got a case processing summary that shows how many cases were analyzed and how many were dropped due to missing data. We didn't have any missing data, so that's a pretty boring table. We've got a descriptives table that has means, confidence intervals, trimmed means, median variance, etc. for each of the three groups. So the variables that I want to call your attention to are the group means, because that's what we're comparing in analysis of variance. So the mean for the no support group, the mean teacher attitude score was 10.4, and then for the teacher aid group, 14, So, which sounds like a reasonable difference to me, and then the score for the peer support group was 11.8. So it looks like there might be some differences there. And then if I look at the 95% confidence intervals around the mean, uh, the no support group has a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval of 8.34 to 12.46. The teacher aid group has a 95% confidence interval of 11.95 to 16.05. And the peer support group has a 95% confidence interval of 10.02 to 13.58. So there's some overlap in all of the 95% confidence intervals, but it's fairly limited for the no support group versus the teacher aid group. So it's difficult to tell just from sort of eyeballing the 95% confidence intervals whether we have a statistically significant result. Sometimes you can eyeball the 95% confidence intervals and if there's no overlap, that's a good indication that you're going to get a statistically significant result if you're using a p-value of 0.05, an alpha level of 0.05. We've got normality tests. You don't want to rely too much on them, but as I've said before, you can be fairly confident if you have non-significant normality tests that your samples are normal, which is the case here. So we're never going to see a higher p-value in the Kolmogorov-Smirnov uh, significance value p-value than 0.2 because it's a lower bound of true significance. So they're saying it could be 0.2, it could be higher than 0.2. The critical factor is that it's greater than 0.05. Similarly, the Shapiro-Wilkes have significance values, p-values, between 0.57 and whew, almost 0.96. So all of those show us that suggest that these are normally distributed samples. These samples are not significantly different from normal, which means that we don't need to make any adjustments. There would be no calls for transforming our data or for using a non-parametric test. Right, so we can look at the histograms. So here's the no support group, which uh, doesn't look like my platonic ideal of a normal distribution. But remember, we've got small sample sizes, so we've got a range of scores. Uh, one person wound up with a score of 6, 1 of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, and then there were two who had scores of 14. The teacher aid group has a little bit more of a normally distributed 
sample in the sense that you can kind of imagine that there's the body of the bell curve around 13, 14, although there's some gaps. This is going to be the case uh, anytime you have small sample sizes. And then ditto for the peer support group. And then here are the QQ plots. I'm just going to scroll through them and then we're going to look at them again in a second. So there's the teacher attitude uh, for no support, teacher aid, and peer support. And then the detrended plots. So re recall that with the normal QQ plots, what we're looking for is uh, data points that fall close to the line. Whereas with the detrended QQ plots, what we're looking for is data points that are about evenly distributed above and below the line. Okay, so to recap, the statistical tests of normality are all non-significant, so those p-values are all greater than 0.05, which indicates that there is no reason to suspect a violation of normality. So as I put it on the slide, there's no significant tests which suggest that samples are normal enough that we can proceed with analysis and variance without doing any transformations or non-parametric tests. And then just to look at the QQ plots again, uh, these are all examples of sufficiently normal QQ plots. Right, the next thing we want to do, since we've determined that the samples are normally distributed, is we can move on to actually conduct the analysis of variance. We still haven't looked at the assumption of homogeneity of variance, but for whatever reason, SPSS has incorporated that assessment into the actual inferential test. So we don't have to do it as a separate step. All right. To conduct a one-way between groups analysis of variance, what we're going to do is go to the Analyze menu and then the Compare Means. And then we've already been in this menu quite a bit looking at independent samples and paired samples t-tests, and now we're going to look at one-way ANOVA. But before I click on that, I want to show you that we can also get to a one-way analysis of variance by looking at the next item down in the Analyze menu, so Analyze General Linear Model, and then Univariate, which just means one dependent variable. We could do a one-way analysis of variance using this table. There's a little bit more to that menu and those options. It has more options and more flexibility, but we will get to that in train. So for now, let's click Analyze, Compare Means, One-Way ANOVA, that brings up this one-way ANOVA window. What we want to do is put our dependent variable in the dependent list. So teacher attitude is our dependent variable, so we're going to move that to the dependent list. And our independent variable, which is what type of support they had, we're going to put that as the factor. And note that you can only have one factor because this is one-way analysis of variance. All right, we're not done yet, though. The next thing we want to do is go, we're going to skip over and come back to the Contrast button and the Post Hoc button. We're going to choose the Options button. So here are my options. You need to select the Homogeneity of Variance test uh, checkbox. Otherwise, it won't do the Levine's test that we need to do to assess homogeneity of variance. I'm going to ask for descriptive statistics again. We've already looked at those in the explore function when we assessed normality, but uh, they're organized in a little bit of a different way that I think makes comparisons a little bit easier when we check that button there in the one-way ANOVA options menu. And because we don't know whether the assumption of homogeneity of variance is going to be valid or violated, I want to look at some ways of reporting F ratios that we can use if the assumption is violated. 
So those are the Brown, Forsyth, F, and Welch's F. And Welch, you might remember, is the type of t-test that we've used before. So when we did independent samples t-tests, we used a Levine test to assess whether homogeneity of variance was valid or violated. If it was valid, we used the top row of the t-test SPSS output table. That was students' t-test. And if it was violated, we just used the second row of the that same table which reported the Welch's t-test. So we're doing the same thing in analysis of variance. The pink book doesn't ask you to include Brown, Forsyth, and Welch, but I think it's good practice to include them anyway. Well, we are going to include a means plot because this helps us to visualize the differences between levels of the independent variable. All right, now click continue. We're still not done. Now let's move on to planned contrasts. Planned contrasts are a very common statistical approach within the analysis of variance family, and they're used in a lot of different ways. The way I want you to think about them as a sort of introduction to planned contrasts is as a way of testing specific alternative hypotheses, usually specific non-directional alternative hypotheses. So the alternative hypothesis that the pink book proffers is that uh, we might predict that the attitudes of teachers who do not receive any support at all will be different from the attitudes of teachers who do receive some support, regardless of what type of support it is. So this is on page 82. And the way we want to assess that is by dividing the three groups into basically two groups. So, uh, and we do that by assigning our two different groups con different contrast coefficients. So the two groups of our three that we want to class together, the two types of support need to have the same contrast coefficient. So we're going to give them both a score of 1, a contrast coefficient of 1. Now we want the sum of all contrast coefficients to be 0. Now we've only got one group left. If we want them to sum to 0, that means that the no support group needs a contrast coefficient of negative 2. Now recall that the way our SPSS file is organized, no support is group 1, Teacher aid is group two, and peer support is group three. We want no support to have a contrast coefficient of negative two, so we put the negative two in first. Teacher aid and peer support are both going to have contrast coefficients of one, so I'm going to add contrast coefficients of one, and then again of one. So what this tells SPSS, this negative 2, 1, 1, is to assign group 1, the group that has the lowest score, which is the no support group, um, the contrast coefficient of negative 2, and to assign the other two groups contrast coefficients of 1. It very helpfully reminds you your coefficient total, which for orthogonal contrasts, which you can read about in field, need to sum to zero, which they do. So what we're testing here is the specific alternative hypothesis that some support, regardless of what type of support, produces different attitudes than no support. Right, so let's click continue. Now what I want you to do is click on the post hoc button. So here are some multiple comparisons for post hoc. Now, ordinarily you probably wouldn't look at, or you wouldn't necessarily look at both planned contrasts and post hoc tests. So one way of using planned contrasts, a typical way of using planned contrasts in one way between groups analysis of variance is when you have a specific alternative hypothesis that you're particularly interested in. So if you had a particular hypothesis that you were particularly interested in, you might look at the planned contrasts and not bother with the post hoc tests. 
Alternatively, you might not have any particular, you might not have any particular investment in one specific alternative hypothesis. You might just want to know if the groups are different, which groups are different. And you may recall that in the setup to example one on page 76, that's how these data were set up. The researcher is interested in, are there any differences in teacher attitudes? And if they are different, which attitudes are different? So the post hoc tests are probably what we would run rather than planned contrasts, but we're just running both as a way of looking at how do we read these tables, how do we interpret these tables, rather than this being something that you would do. All right, so in this post hoc multiple comparisons window, you notice you've got lots of options and they're divided into do we assume equal variances or not? We've got a significance level down at the bottom that you can adjust. So this is our family-wise error rate. Uh, an SPSS will do the calculations of figuring out what do we need to do to adjust the per comparison alpha to in order to maintain a family-wise or experiment-wise error rate of 0.05. Now, there are lots of options in each of these. Recall that we don't know whether we are going to have equal variances. We don't know whether our sample has equal variances or not yet. We haven't done the Levine's test and we can't do the Levine's test until we calculate the F ratio because that's how SPSS has built everything. So it might be a good idea to include at least one of each. One strategy that you can use is just check all of those options. So do all of the different possible post hoc tests. That way, once you see the results, you can kind of choose which one is the most appropriate. Instead of doing that, what I would encourage you to do is, at least as a first pass, choose the equal variance is assumed option and the equal variance is not assumed option that would be most appropriate. Uh, and for what we're doing, if we're just asking, are they different? If they're different, which groups are different? The sort of standard when you have equal sample sizes is to look at Tukey's honestly significant difference. So the Tukey's HSD. So I'm going to choose Tukey's HSD. Other post-hoc comparisons that uh, people sometimes report, Bonferroni comparisons are conservative comparisons, but they can be a good approach when you have a small number of group differences that you're specifically interested in. So you might have four, five, six, seven different groups, which means that you've got 10, uh, 15, etc., different possible pairwise comparisons. You might only be interested in two or three of those in particular, so you might, in those circumstances, run a Bonferroni. Uh, the Ryan test, when you have a, a sort of feeling about which groups are different, that's the REGWF and the REGWQ, are also tests that people sometimes use. The other one that is sort of more frequent is the Dunnett test. Now that's if you've got a control category and you're specifically interested in testing which groups are significantly different from control. So if you have a, uh, so the next example that we're going to look at is different types of diets. You might have a no diet condition where participants just eat what they normally eat and then compare four different types of diets to a no diet condition. You might be interested in asking, are any of these diets effective? So in that case, what you'd be specifically interested in is comparing each of your different diets to the reference category of your control group. In that case, what you would want to do is a Dennett's test. And then you have to specify the control category. It has to be either the first group or the last group. And then you can specify whether you want that to be a two-tailed or a one-tailed test. Regardless, we're not doing that. We're not comparing to a 
single control condition. We're specifically interested in are there any group differences, and if so, what are they? So we're just going to look at two keys, and the alternative that we want to look at, just in case the assumption of homogeneity is violated, is the game's howl. So long way of saying, in the one-way ANOVA post hoc multiple comparisons window, choose Tukey and choose Games Howl, and we're choosing Tukey because we have equal sample sizes in each group. We're setting our family-wise error rate to 0.05, and then we're clicking Continue. All right, so we've already looked at the options. We've covered planned contrasts, and we just covered post hoc tests. That's all I want to do, and now we're ready to click OK. Okay, we've got a fair bit of output. I'm going to scroll through them quickly, and then I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint to go through them in a little bit more detail. So we've got a descriptives table because we asked for it. So the Levine's test is the same Levine's test that we used for independent samples t-test. It's just appearing in its own table now. now. We also asked for that specifically. The ANOVA table is the table that you would get no matter what options you check. That's where we will probably look at our F ratio. The table underneath it, the robust tests of equality of means, is the table that we would use to get our F ratio and our degrees of freedom if a Levine test revealed a violation of homogeneity of variance. Then we've got some details about the contrast coefficients for our specific hypothesis that we're testing. The output of that planned contrast then we've got the output of the multiple comparisons for the post hoc tests. Another, a second way, the homogeneous subsets table is an, just another way of looking at those multiple comparisons. And then lastly, because we asked for it, we get a means plot. And now let's go over and talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. So that first table is the descriptive statistics table. It doesn't have as many descriptive statistics as the explore function. It's got sample size, which you can see is the same for all three groups, the mean of 10.4, 14, 18.0. Standard deviations are all about 2.8, except for the peer support is 2.5. Then we've got standard error, 95% confidence interval, minimum, and maximum. So we don't have anything about skew or kurtosis or etc. But here are uh, measures of central tendency and dispersion organized a little bit more compactly than they were in the uh, explore descriptives table. So that's the reason that I like to look at the descriptives table is if I'm going back and reporting descriptive statistics, or if I want to know, okay, what was that standard deviation again, or if I wanted to create a graph based on these means and standard deviations, or means and standard errors, or means and confidence intervals, then I can get those data much faster from looking at this one table than from sort of jumping around in the explore table. So what we can tell from the group means is that the mean is highest for the teacher aid group. And then we can tell from this SIG level, the, the p-value for the Levine test, that the variances are homogeneous. So the Levine's test uh, score of 0.186, that's an F ratio, with 2 and 27 degrees of freedom. And a p-value of 0.831 tells us that the variances are homogeneous. The assumption of homogeneity of variance is valid. All right, so because the assumption of homogeneity of variance is valid, it's not violated, and this is how we might write it. We wouldn't use capital letters like that in a report, but we would include an F and the two degrees of freedom, two different numbers for numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, the test score rounded to two decimal places, and the p-value rounded to two decimal places. Now what that tells us remember, is it tells us which of these next two tables to use, where to get the F ratio. And because the assumption of homogeneity of variance is not violated, we want to use the ANOVA table, not the robust tests of equality of means table, to report our F ratio. 
if we had gotten a violation, we would report either the Welch's F or the Brown's Forsyth F. So here's our analysis of variance. And we've got an F ratio of 4.359. Right? So that F ratio is the mean squared between divided by mean squared within, so that 33 almost divided by 7.5, a little bit more, which gives us a ratio of 4.359, which is statistically significant at an alpha level of 0.05. How did we get the mean squares? Well, mean squared is sum of squared divided by degrees of freedom, so we've got the whole, sometimes called an ANOVA source table in this main ANOVA table labeled ANOVA right here. So the way to interpret that F ratio of 4.359, which is larger than our critical value, is that there's a statistically significant difference between at least two of the teacher groups. And the way we would report it is sort of the same way that we report Levine's test. So an F of 2 and 27, and we get that 2 and 27 from this table, and then we report the F ratio and the p-value of 0.02. So it doesn't tell us which groups are statistically significantly different, but it does tell us that there's a statistically significant difference somewhere. So that F ratio, that statistically significant F ratio tells us that there is a statistically significant difference between at least two of the teacher groups. It doesn't tell us which two. So that means that it makes sense to then go on and look at either planned contrasts if you are specifically interested in a particular a priori alternative hypothesis about which two groups might be different, or post hoc tests if what we want to know is which groups are different in a sort of a theoretical way. Okay, so if you haven't already done so, now's a good time to save your output file with a memorable file name so that you can come back to it. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the second video. So the video part two of this tutorial, we're going to pick up right where we left off and start looking at the planned contrasts and post hoc tests. All right, see you soon.